Welcome to the inner world of filmmaking. I'm your host, Tammy McGarrow. I'm an editor, podcaster, and still photographer. In this show, I will interview filmmakers in all facets of production and distribution. I'm excited to talk with Janie McGill on her first film, Arrowhead, a documentary about an all-female expedition across the empty quarter of the Arabian Desert. Welcome, Janie. So happy to have you on the show today. Hi, Tammy. Thank you very much for having me. So, I mean, what an interesting background you have. I mean, you come from military to making a film. I mean, do you want to tell us the story of your horse racing accident that ultimately changed your life direction? Yeah, sure. So what I had um, had a life plan that I was going to join the military as a lawyer. Um, so I was doing my studying at the time. And to get a foot in the door, I decided to join the reserves. And I ended up asking for permission to ride and represent my regiment in a military horse race um, at one of the big race courses here in the UK. Um, but unfortunately, in the training, I had quite a bad accident. I fractured five vertebrae. Had to have a lot of metal work put into my um, spine to stabilize it. And that ultimately kind of changed the direction of my life or the one that I had planned. So I did set up a business for five years. And when I left that, the wheels came off a little bit for me. You know, I lost my purpose and sort of was struggling to find an identity that was purposeful and, you know, something that I felt settled in. Um, so I was very unsettled for quite a few years. After the accident, I met a chap in the SAS who took me to Oman. He showed me a small arrowhead on our first date and he said, it's from the empty quarter. And I was just like, oh my God, where is the empty quarter? That place sounds absolutely amazing. Um, we never actually made it to the empty quarter, but I, it planted a seed and I knew that I would go there one day. And I wasn't sure how or why or, or in what way, but I was magnetized to the place. And that's ultimately, I think, oh gosh, 12 years ago, 11 years ago. Oh, wow. And so then that's how you decide, or, you know, later you would decide to create Her Faces of Change. Um, can you talk about, like, how that came about and then you deciding to film the expedition? Sure. So I think when I'd lost my way a bit, I was actually messing about as a supporting artist in feature films and doing a bit of presenting and this kind of thing. So I was used to the camera by this point. Um, and enjoyed being in front of it. Um, I'd also made a decision not to have children, and that sort of frightened me a little bit because I thought, crikey, or you know, all of this life and for what? Because my my legacy won't <laughs> won't go on. It's just going to stop dead. And I thought, God, I don't like the sound of that because this is quite you know, this is all quite hard work. <laughs> so right. <laughs> Yeah, so I I decided that I wanted to, to leave a legacy. And that legacy for me was, um, first of all, in art. I was modeling for artists and photographers. And then it progressed on to film. And then I thought, right, I'm going to film this expedition. I initially wanted to walk it on my own. And then I met a man... I'm sorry, it's really, there's a lot of um, elements that go into this story and it can get a little bit confusing, so I'll can't try and keep it um, as simple as possible. Somebody basically planted another seed and said, if you go to um, the Middle East, go to Oman to walk the desert, do it with Omani women because you will see a world that nobody else will see. You know, as in, if you're with a man or if you're in a male-female couple, it's unlikely that you will see the female world of of that country because it's very private. So that gave me goose pimples. And I was just like, I want to see the world that nobody else gets to see. That's too exciting. And that's when it really evolved. And at the time I was I was doing a couple of recce. So I was living in France at the time. And that's, yeah, that's when the, the expedition really evolved into inviting other women onto it. So I was living in France at the time, doing a couple of, of recce's, 
and I met a lady called Maggie Jeans um, in the British Embassy. It, you know, this whole project was very much an evolution. It was never anything that I really sat down and planned. I just knew I wanted to go there and it was not scripted in any way. I suppose in it was scripted in the fact that I wanted women with me and I wanted to work with men. Um, there was question of, you know, do we do it all women? But the truth is I, we are, we work together, you know, like it's an yeah. equal world right. and I want to work with men as much as I want to work with women. And that was very, very strong for me, that side of things. I don't want to separate the sexes anymore. You know, we all need to muck in together. And actually it's down to what skills we have and what strengths we have. And that, became ultimately the the message of the film is that we're better together um, regardless of gender identity and culture um, and then I met uh, Beda and Athea through various contacts of mine so I never I never put a call out for women like a public one that people applied to I met people through people wow how interesting that it all came together and sometimes how interesting that happens where um, just the right people align to the project organically. It totally was. I mean, I really, I knocked on doors, certainly, but there was nothing set in stone because it was, it was quite a magical process to see how it did evolve. And, you know, I think sometimes when you plan so much, you can miss the most beautiful things. And that I I didn't want to miss anything. Uh, or, or you could have got it the other way and say, yeah, I missed loads of things because I didn't plan it. I don't know, but the, my the essence of me is just to discover and explore and let things unfold. Much to the dismay of some of my team members, I must say. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was that was um, that was one of the beautiful things for me, and one of the things that I enjoyed so much was what's around the corner who's around the corner when you decided to do this i mean d did was it always 28 days and you're going to go 758 kilometers to the end or can you walk me through the expedition how it came about to the timing and what you were going to do yeah sure. it was um again there was no rhyme or reason i went on a recce i thought okay there's a good, there is a good start point because Oman borders Yemen and Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Um, I didn't want to go cl too close to either of those borders. Well, the smugglers and thing, you know, there's stuff happens. So I wanted to avoid that just in case. Um, so I didn't go too close to Yemen, but we started right down south. And then the idea roughly was 800 kilometers north to a beautiful fort that I'd found at the foothills of the Hajar mountain range in the north. And I, it just felt right. You know, I think a lot of the, a lot of the <laughs> process has been based on my gut feeling and my intuition. And just, I just let that lead me really. And was the mileage daunting at all? <laughs> like, no. Or did you not even think about it? You were just like, oh, my God, we're going to go from here to here. And that'll be a beautiful, nice walk for all of us. Yeah, my, I've walked a lot anyway. Okay. I'd already done a nearly a 700-mile walk in the UK in okay. one go. So the walking for me, it's not daunting because I just see it as we all put one foot in front of the other. You know, every single day, it's just a repetition of that. So no, I don't, I wasn't daunted by that. To be honest, I wasn't daunted by anything, really, because I really enjoy when things go wrong. <laughs> like, I really, <laughs> I really enjoy the process of, of problem solving. And I get very excited if things don't go quite as they should you know I, fi I find that um yeah it, very stimulating so there I mean uh, there were points where it could have very badly gone wrong or not happened at all in the 10 days right. before we started 
Um, that was down to permissions and um, for the vehicles because I managed to get a sponsorship from Land Rover uh, for two vehicles. But this was just a wild card in the fact that they were on commercial plates and so therefore we needed permission from the Ministry of Defence, the police and the um, Ministry of Information, I think it was. And that, I mean, that in itself is a big, big job. And I think probably the greatest success of the expedition was managing to get those permissions within 10 days, um, which is quite unheard of. But we had Maggie Jeans in our corner, who is like oh my the yellow pages of Oman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, so did you have in mind like, a certain what, what month did you shoot in and were you thinking about the weather or anything within why you picked when you picked uh purely down to the weather um because november december january which is when i was there is the months where it's more pleasant shall we say i mean certainly pleasant in muscat but get into the desert and it's a bit hotter i think the the hottest day we had was around 45 degrees and then very chilly at night and literally the heat would just smack you around the face at 10 o'clock and at two o'clock in the afternoon it was like being hit it was odd actually but yeah so that that's essentially the only reason why I picked that time and then did you scope out how many kilometers that you were going to go each day because um I was reading in the film you know, uh, about the film, and it said that it was a 28-day expedition at 758 kilometers, which for us, it's 471 miles. Um, and then I divided that by 28. So were you going like 27 kilometers a day, 16 miles each day? Or did you have certain days you'd go longer? And then how did you work that out? Or did you just wing it? Well, we winged it. <laughs> of course. One of the yeah, yeah. Well, it was basically it's down to injury, it's down to terrain. We didn't know exactly what we'd be coming across. We didn't know whether the cars would make it, you know, so there were so many factors. The main thing was we were getting from A to B at some stage. Um and I think the longest we walked on one day was forty kilometers. Um and I oh. don't remember the lowest one. You never remember the lowest one, do you? It was no. the impressive one. But yeah, we did. We actually did it a lot quicker than what we'd expected as well. Well, let's talk about the ladies. I mean, do you, what was your, I mean, they ha had to have been in pretty good shape, right? To do this or, or walk a lot or, I mean, how do you train to do something like this? And how did, the, and how did they train to do this? Well, my input was it's time on your feet. So even if you're sat, you know, in an office, stand at your desk and, you know, walk as much as you can. I know we none of us were probably in the best shape in the world. But again, for me, it's the fact of we're walking, you know, we just we get fit as we go. I think you need to have a base level of fitness for sure. Right. Um but I, I mean, for me, I walk my dogs every day, you know, and I think I did, I did probably two or three 25 mile walks before I left. The girls I know were walking in the, I think in the mornings along the beach, but we, none of us really trained. We just did. Okay. But, okay, well, I tell you, but, but that wasn't necessarily the best thing in the world because I actually, we pushed it a bit on the first day and Athea did get a little gro uh, groin pull, I think. Um, I, I think there was the thing of being a bit overexcited, a bit, we were 10 days behind schedule. So I was a bit pushy about, you know, catching up and um, that kind of thing. So, so, okay, let's talk about the challenges then. Can you describe some of the challenges that went along the way and that you had to problem solve? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the challenges were our minds and our personalities. You know, essentially you're throwing six strangers into a desert for 28 days under, a, you know, quite intense conditions. 
Um, no one's comfortable. No one's sleeping in a bed. You know, we're all tired and and sort of going over and above. And with that comes disagreements. I mean, certainly we disagreed and there was conflict. And I actually put a lot of that down to my leadership as well, because I'm sort of a, a natural born people pleaser. And I was kind of pleasing, not, you know, strictly leading. And certainly my way of doing things conflicted with some of my team's way of doing things, which were very much by the book. And I, I hate by the book. I mean, you know, I made a film not by the book. So that, you know what I mean? So, wow. and, and I'll be honest, the by the book thing for me, um, with my military career didn't work out. So I never trusted the book. <laughs> <laughs> so the book can just be thrown away, uh, right. frankly, um, because there's always more than one way to skin a cat, shall we say. Oh, the poor cat. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> poor book. yeah, well, I was just thinking about that, that in life, nothing goes as planned, just like in filmmaking. So you have to kind of have a thought and the plan was 28 days from A to B. But then things are obviously going to happen during, and it's all in what you do with it. So I'm curious, how did you film it? And then getting everybody's different perspectives, did you sit down and have interviews? I mean, how was this shot? Because I would think as you're walking, you're like, don't ask me a freaking question. I, I need to get to A to B, man. I don't want to talk about things. <laughs> So how did you do that part? Do you, can I take a step back, actually, yeah, and tell you? sure. Because of the delays and the permissions that we needed to get, my production team actually pulled out two oh, days wow. before. And one of my drivers pulled out as well. So I was just like, oh, no, but secretly quite excited. Um, and I'd had... Um, Matt, who is um, directing and editing and did the cinematography for the film, he had come to me again via a, a random Facebook meeting. Another executive producer, Michael Kirtley now, he had a desert on his Facebook page and I was just like, oh, nice desert, where's that? And he said, oh, it's the Sahara, do you know deserts? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to the desert. <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> we started chatting and he said, my friend Matt's coming over from L.A. I'd love him to interview you. Matt's a filmmaker. So I was like, wow. awesome. So we met in, I think, October, the year that I went. So I was kind of talking to him on the phone saying, you know, shoot, Matt, my, my production team's um, left. I need to find some other people. So I was trying to find other people on Facebook pages and what have you. And then I said to him, Matt, will you come out and film? So within two days, he was on a flight to Salala, which is in the south. Me and my team were still in Muscat <laughs> waiting <laughs> for the permissions. So he was filling his time, you know, filming the mountains down there waiting for us. And then we finally got down to the hotel in Salala with uh, leaving the next morning. I got food poisoning that night. Oh. <laughs> so the day we were leaving, I was not feeling the best in the world. But the with the filming, so essentially what we did was video diaries every night. So Matt would set up the camp. And my God, honestly, what that man had to go through, a lone man film, trying to film it three for five people's you know stories it was a massive job for him and in hindsight you needed two people really you know if not three um because the the sand was so fine that the equipment needed probably about an hour and a half worth of cleaning every night just to get oh, rid wow. of that sort of dust and then he's got to back up the film you know it was a, a big big job and and then, of course, you're missing valuable parts of the evening whilst you're cleaning the the camera and this. So it was it was a massive challenge. And your studio is on the front seat of a Land Rover, you know, the passenger seat. So that was a massive challenge for him. Um, he walked probably half of the empty quarter backwards 
filming us. Um, but we also we also stopped a lot to have conversations, you know, because a lot of what I wanted to unearth as well were conversations around our different lifestyles, our different cultures, you know, our, our experiences um, as women, as people. Because um, I had a very challenging relationship with my dad and um, very patriarchal, um, traditional upbringing. So that really interested me in the Middle East. Is it like this? And that, so there was a lot of exploration, a lot of sitting down and filming and discussing. And so that's how the filming went. Again, not scripted. So kind of fly by the seat of your pants kind of stuff. So I was kind of curious. Um, okay. So tell me the crew, everybody that was there and who's driving the car. Yeah. So we had, you need two support vehicles when you go into a desert in case one gets bogged another one has to pull it out and also so two vehicles we had mark who was a contact through the military who came out and Tarek, who was again another contact who i met through you know evolution of meetings and chance introductions so i had an omani driver and an english driver an american filmmaker English organizer, producer, now producer, and Beda and Athea, who um, had the heart to do it and the enthusiasm. And that's why they came. There was no question. They were in. And that's that was my criteria. I, I, I didn't believe... I know because I've done so much walking. I know because I've been badly injured. I know what we are capable of as people. So even at some points, if they didn't think they felt capable or if they had a niggling injury, I just knew that they would do it because it was it was in them to finish it. You know, I find that so fascinating. There's this film that was done, or it's a series about extreme kind of like uh, it was with uh, Chris Helmsworth and I th found it kind of fascinating like uh, this culture they were they'd have to hunt for their food and it could take four or five days before they're they find food so like what you just said I think we are more resilient than we know and Absolutely. we can move past things if we just I think sometimes we just give up but if I mean, what are the miracles if we just kept going to see in ourselves? Exactly. Yeah, exactly that. And I certainly, you know, there were times when we did have little disagreements as such. No one ever lost their temper. People got upset, sure, um, because of miscommunication. I, you, you know, back then I was not the best communicator either, like, up, my brain up there is 10 steps ahead of what's coming out of my mouth. I can imagine it would be very difficult to be on that with me if you don't understand that or are used to that. That, I'd say, did cause a little bit of uncertainty, certainly, and friction within the group. But I think all three of us had just had laid it all on the line to do it. You know, and I think I was... I was very fortunate that that I had found two women who were like that. Um, because I, I do know a lot of friends have fallen out forever with people. You know, we still chat and we're still in touch. And there is, as far as I'm concerned, no animosity at all. It's purely you're in a you're in an unconventional place doing an unconventional thing you're going to have unconventional disagreements and that doesn't make anyone bad people, you know? And so move on after it and learn from it. And and I hope, I think I have. Oh my God, that is such a good point because I think there is so much, one, miscommunication that goes on between and, people and assumption and reaction. Yeah. So, and and that can just kill a friendship, a relationship of whatever sort. So- I think for, I hate to say forcing, but just like um, having everybody 
agree to doing 28 days and be committed, because how many people are really committed, but to commit to we are going to finish this really, I think, forces you to get through the difficulties. Because after a point in time, I'm sure you're just like, okay, I got to just let this go. You know, like, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to keep holding on to this anger or whatever, resentment or, you know, and then it's just talking it out. And like you were saying that maybe, uh, you know, you realize that the way that you process or you're always thinking ahead, but nobody, unfortunately, nobody else is in your head to know that. Um, no. But then you learn about yourself and you learn about your communication style and you learn how could I be better or how could I be more transparent yes. or what do I need to work on? So I found I find that very fascinating. Can you tell me about some of do you mind sharing maybe some of the things that went on, uh, the difficulties, and then how did you get to the other side of them? Yeah, so I think the... Um... The three of us, I think this helped us complete it as well. The three of us, and, and this is kind of where the storyline goes. I don't want to give too much away and, and, and not keep too much, but <laughs> each one of us had a thing that we were trying to work out, like a vulnerability or say weakness, just some past, you know, there's, you know, we all have a past, we all have maybe like there's a bit of depression or a challenging relationship or you feel underestimated, whatever it is. And that, I think, those were the things that I think held us back. So it was, in some ways, I think, and it wasn't just about me and the girls, it was about me and me and the drivers and all of us together um, as a group. It was a case of insecurity ping pong, you know? So very much when it was, it was very much holding a mirror up to your face, or for me it was anyway, holding a mirror up to my face and seeing really horrible things that I didn't want to see anymore, you know, and just right. going, wow, that person has made me see that, made me feel like that or made me behave that way. Why? Let's get to the bottom of it and let's try and iron this out because it's not necessary for this to be going on and these clashes to be going on because it's all something from our past experience which has, you know, triggered these emotions within us which are now batting against one another. Um, and I think beyond that, it's just a massive learning point all around that, you know, from from an individual scale in a relationship to a, to a, a wider scale within, you know, political parties or whatever it is, you know, friendships, however it goes, it, a lot of the time, I think when there's fallouts, it is because there's something deep within you that there's an issue there that's not been solved or there's some hurt or pain or whatever it is. Um, of course, in some cases, people are just farces, but... <laughs> right, right, exactly. I, but what I... <laughs> yeah. But what I was thinking about when you were sharing that is, wow, this is therapy. You know, this is yeah. therapy where you're in a group, different dynamics, different triggers, different traumas, all coming out. F but it, it's I, I feel like it's an opportunity to heal if you want yes. to. And not everybody can go there. And that's so beautiful that you all kind of had this feels like a safe environment to really open up, be vulnerable, and heal a lot of those traumas and triggers. Yeah. I, do you know as well, though, Tammy, I don't know if we all knew that that was going on at the time. I mean, it's taken a huge amount of reflection um, in the last couple of years to sort of, and I, I'm still learning from it, um, and I'm pretty sure everyone else is as well. I. I was chatting with Mark the other day and he said, yeah, I, I, after 26 years in the army, I saw that there was another way to do things. Um, you know, but then again, you've got the two extremes of, of me <laughs> and then the, the military. Um, so <laughs> I think there's a rebellion in that though as well, you know, Yes. um, for sure. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, 
he and I clashed. There's no doubt about it. But I, I, I laugh at it now, and I think we both we both have a mutual understanding that we're uh, <laughs> you know, we're on the same page. We were going through the same things, but in different ways. Um, yeah. And that was yeah, it was very uh, very special. Very special to to keep that with you and keep learning from it as well. Yes. Now, were the diaries for everyone, including Matt and the drivers? Did everybody share their thoughts? So it was mainly focused on the three of us. Um, okay. Because there's there's not actually a huge amount of time once you've walked all day. Once you've done your admin to get ready for the next day and eat, you are massively lacking in time. And that's where I say they'd probably be better if there was two or three um, yeah. film crew to be able to catch that because Matt was under a huge amount of pressure. Um, but he did, you know, whilst the girls and I were walking and if he was in the in the support vehicles with Mark or Tarek, maybe doing some drone shots or whatever, he did have a chance to to interview them or, or film them at the time. Um, so there was a, a, a mix of, of the girls and of, of what's going on um, with the support, but in in support of us, the, the women. So everybody was pretty committed to not stopping. So there was no time where somebody said, I'm done. Everybody was no. pretty much, okay. And then um, how did it go with the car, the Land Rover? I mean, did it make it the whole trek? Was there any problems with the car where it gets stuck and then you're like, oh my God, we're, what are we going to do? Yeah, but we didn't, the girls didn't see that. We didn't see it. That, oh, okay. I, only, that I only saw in the footage afterwards. <laughs> you know, and yeah, they had terrible trouble, you know, get, getting bogged and you know, having to pull each other out. But I tell you what, it looked like an absolute blast. It was so much fun. But for them, it wasn't, you know, whilst they're having a huge amount of fun, like tearing around the desert, of course, there is always in the back of their mind, oh, we got to meet them at camp, you know? <laughs> and have them set up. So, but every morning we had to leave with, you know, uh, water, enough water, three, what did I used to carry? I think I carried five litres every day um, in case they didn't, couldn't meet us, you know. So we were always, we always had uh, provisions in case we couldn't get to them. But we also had good comms, you know, so. Oh, okay. Uh, so were they ahead of you or did they let you, they're setting up camp, they're trying to get to their destination? But they wouldn't have known when you would stop, right? I mean, how would they know where to stop? How did that go? I mean... Yeah, so um, every night we would work out where we would be okay. the next or an, or maybe one or two options of okay. where we were going to be. And they would either kind of leapfrog us. So if we left at five in the morning, they'd you know, still be in their, t in their sleeping bags or whatever, and then pack up the camp. We might or might not see them because actually for the vehicles, it was, um, it, it was a big issue to, basically you had to pre-plan a couple of days in advance because the vehicles were so heavily laden with food, fuel and water and equipment. The, the guys, they couldn't, when the dunes were really big, they had to be so careful where they drove um, in case the, the vehicles toppled. So they had to sort of have a route five days in advance of where they would be to keep us on our A to B trajectory and to not slip into Saudi Arabia as well because we, I said we wanted to avoid the border but at some points we were close and for two weeks, we had to be self-sufficient because there was no easy route in or out for a resupply. Um, so that they probably had a harder job of navigating than we did. And then with food, what kind of foods did you bring? Um, food, we had, I think we had oats and oats in the morning. Um, 
we had a lot of trail mix, a lot of nuts and, and dried fruit and dates, of course. Um, but the dates, uh, they were taint. I'm sure they were tainted with diesel or something. They'd been, <laughs> they'd been put, oh. put by the exhaust or something. There was always a little taste of diesel. Um, and we had tins of tuna every day. You know, like uh-huh. the snack pots of tuna. Uh-huh. Um, so that was every day. And then rice. Um, I don't, just stuff, you know, easy stuff to either pasta or something like that. Right. Um, Did you then create a fire sorry. or anything? Did you cook anything like fire at the end or no? Try to keep everything. Yes. No, every I was I I felt that it was absolutely essential to have a a campfire every night. Um for a couple of reasons because it's romance and it's lovely to have a a live fire. I think it brings it's a central point for the camp so that you know, if everyone's finished doing what they've got to do, we can all sit around it. Um, so it was kind of a, a community thing as well, almost to have that fire. Um, and we did, I think we did cook on it. Yeah. And then, um, so you had tents, so you were sleeping on in tents. I'm taking it. I did. And yet you didn't work. Did you sleep no. among the stars? I yeah, I've gone to the desert. I'm not. I slept in a tent one night because um, there were lots of snake tracks in the camp, and I thought, okay, I, I, de- and they come to the warmth, don't they? So I definitely didn't want to be waking up with a snake under my, under my pillow. Um, but other than that, no, I slept by the fire under the stars. Um, I wrapped a shemag around my head and tucked it into my sleeping bag just so that the creepy crawlies didn't come in. Um, but other than that, I could see th- it's sheer, so I could see through it, and it was just I don't know, very liberating. So, what are the creepy crawlers that you have to be aware of when you're out in the desert? Uh, scorpions, but actually, we only saw one. Um, oh my god! It. And just little spiders. Oh. I don't think there was supposedly camel spiders, but I don't think we saw any camel spiders. But I just don't like. Yeah, I don't. I don't want really want things crawling on me well right and and you don't know what's out there probably too <laughs> yeah and exactly. i didn't even think about the snakes Oof. um yeah, how I mean, do they survive out there well that's it's interesting spiders. actually because yeah there was yeah but there, there was monsoons um there were quite heavy rains the season before we got there and there was a huge amount of greenery in the desert None of us were expecting that amount of kind of shrubbery and and life. There were so many locusts as well. Um, the locusts were phenomenal. They would they'd kind of sleep on the trees, and then in the morning, if we left very early, they must have felt our vibration or something because they would all just drop off the trees, and you'd hear just tap, you know tapping <laughs> as they drop off their branches and then you know you sort of imagine them waking up it, you know what it is it's like being in a disney film being in the desert so take uh-huh. away the awful mentalness that's going on and the <laughs> and the conflicts right. of personality and all of that but it is the most incredible feeling of being there and it's so vast and immense and and this was another weird thing so when you're walking all you see is what your vision allows you to see right but then if you see the drone footage that matt's taken um during the day you then see what you're walking in and it is in well in the teaser you see that insane desert and it's just unbelievable and because uh, you think you you sort of think you're you're quite sane because you're just going for a walk and you know you're trying to take yourself away from society a little bit and right. then you look at that and you think oh god maybe this is a bit mad sort of bit you know why yeah. what, what are we doing this for it's it's sort of a, a funny thing, isn't it? I, and there was there was yeah. lots of sort of moments of, what the hell are we here for? Why are we doing this? Is this stupid? Is it clever? I don't really know what it is, but it but it is. It is what it is. And I think that's ultimately we all found each other to be there. 
yeah, I, I guess that's the the surprise of it all is what is like you were saying the reflection afterwards of everything that you learn. It's an experience that um, I'm thinking nobody can say that they did, right? You were kind of the first to do that, or have others done this track? No, others have done this, and uh, oh. in fact, others have done longer. And what we learned um, when we came across a Bedouin village was that actually the the Bedouin women would walk triple, quadruple times that just to find food. And you know, oh. so all of these things there are, you know, as as kind of I don't know us us Brits, we love a bit of exploring and so called conquering, don't we? And you just forget that so many people and natives have been doing exactly what you're doing and, you know, well done, very clever. You've walked the desert, which like Everest as well, you know, Sherpas are up and down it like, like anything. And, and we just, just think it's this grand thing and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. I do, it doesn't matter. I just sort of had to be there. But I don't think when we do these things, we should forget everything and everyone that's gone before us that was just doing it to survive we're right. in a pretty privileged position to make the choice where we where we can choose to do something like that but then yeah. i think sometimes as well it's like well is it because we've just lost touch with ourselves and i think that certainly was part of it for me now did you come across anybody on this on your travels that you was going the other way <laughs> Um, not not walking, uh, but we did come across Border Force and when we went further north, there's quite a lot of oil fields. So we were on, on track sometimes as um, to avoid the dunes, whether it be through injury, whatever. There were, well, it's still sand, but it's sort of used. Um, so people would stop and go, you know, what the hell are you doing here? Or, oh my God, I heard you on the radio a month ago and you're actually doing it, that kind of thing. But they were wonderful because also it's mostly men that, well, no, it was all men that we saw. Um, and they would all stop and they would all want to know what the hell we were doing, why we were doing it. And they would all give us their lunches. <laughs> so, Aww. Yeah, it was really, it was really lovely. And, and that's something that I really must say as well, is that the way I had organized this, um, this trip was under the assumption that men would stop us. You know, you know what we're told, the Middle East suppression of women or what have you. Now, that may be the case. I think it's the case across the world. However, we could not have had more support from the Omani men um, and they were a big part of why it could actually happen because they pushed through so much for us for the permissions so we had a lot of people backing us to do this and that was it, that was quite exciting for all three of us to be honest yeah um, it just makes me think that you know, our perspective and what we're told and what we hear, not to say that a lot of that doesn't happen, but it's always a pleasant surprise when you have a different yeah. um, experience and then you can walk away with that experience, you know? Yeah. That people I think aren't media, all bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's what the media kind of lead us to believe, isn't it? And and the yeah. bad is always put under a magnifying glass, but it also pollutes people's minds. Yep. And and again causes this this conflict and misunderstanding between people. You know, so many people ask me, you know, was is it dangerous out there? I'm like, probably no more dangerous than living in London, you know, or and there's danger everywhere. It's kind of just, I say try and be sensible about it, but I don't know if I am. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it's just being aware, being aware of your surroundings. And, you know, L.A., I'm sure, is that where you are, Tammy, here in uh, L.A.? I'm in San Diego. Oh, San Diego. Well, look, it's there's not... danger there. You know, yes. like, 
it's a city for God's sakes. Of course, there's danger. Yeah. Um, I felt certainly felt safer in the in the desert and in Oman and Muscat than I did ever in living in London for fifteen years. That's really yeah. great. I mean, it's great yeah. to to just have a, I don't know, just a different perspective of <laughs> of living. I think you're yeah. right with the media and stuff. The media just puts so much fear, fear, fear. Everybody. You, you just stay in your home, yeah. but, but that's not life. And that's not a lot of people's experience either. So, um, it, it can't stop you from taking chances and stuff. So I was curious, what did you learn from this experience and what was your takeaway? Now looking back. Oh, God, anything, 98% of things are possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> If you have the will um, to do it, and it's a priority for you. Um, and I think the takeaway is, is go and experience things for yourself and don't listen to the news. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen to the news and don't read the newspaper. And I mean, I've, I'm a lot happier for not doing that, for sure, because yes. it's very invasive. I think the news and it's never good. Yep. And and I often wonder what's true and what isn't. I mean just because you know cuz yeah. a lot of times people will uh you know misconstrue the truth and even media out there too. So you got to be very careful about what you're hearing and is it true cuz sometimes it's not or it's yeah. spun. Exactly. But equally as well. My experience in Oman might be very different to somebody else's. You know, me as a person, the experiences that I've had may interpret things very differently to other people. Um, so it's my it's my truth. It's what I've seen. I can only communicate that, but it, it might not be what somebody else sees. You know? Right. Yeah, I'm often curious if what we attract is where we're at and the lessons that we kind of need to learn um, for good or for bad. And some people can have a lot more better experience than others. Um, I just, I'm always trying to look at every situation as a learning experience, like what this is happening to me, or sometimes things are happening to somebody else and you're the voyeur to that experience. And then maybe it Maybe that's how you're going to learn the experience is just being the voyeur. So somebody may watch your film and have a yeah. lot of stuff be triggered and brought up for themselves and food for thought, but in a different way than having to go and walk it like you guys did. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. It's it's provocative, you know, and and certainly. I think there the the sort of stories that come from this film and the the scenarios that we face presently and in the past, I think they there will be something in there that touches everybody in one way. I don't I I don't think it's possible for it not to. Yes. Um so and that's why I think it's such a will be such a poignant film. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. Um I so I was curious this, would you do it again? I think if someone said, here's the money, go and do it, <laughs> then yes. But I'm still paying for it. So. <laughs> I'm, you know, I wasn't, I, it wasn't commissioned. It wasn't, I, I tried, but met production companies and things and all of them just said, this is going to be really hard. And I was just like, okay, I can do without your negativity. I'm just going right. to go and do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think... I never say never, but um, I think there are, are certainly things that I've learned and to do it with a decent budget. Right. Or you just do it somewhere else, do another trek of something yeah. else. I mean, probably not I, do the same thing again. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, there was one uh, trip that I had in mind after this one's finished, but sadly it goes through um, Russia. So that's I uh, uh, not a good, I don't think that's probably the best bet in the world. Currently. Yeah, or at least at this time. You at know. this time, it could. Yeah. It's a story that could be told in a different way, anyway. So, um, 
Yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I've got another film up my sleeve. Yeah, yeah. So um, this film is now in the film festivals. Um, just really quick, what did you shoot the film on? I, I, what kind of camera did you use to shoot it? GH5. Okay. Panasonic. And Panasonic. Okay. And then um, how long did the film end up being? I think it's approximately one hour and 25. Okay. And was it challenging to edit? Hugely. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, very, very challenging. Um, as I said before, the production company hadn't had pulled out, so they weren't there. Um, so, I mean, there's there's the videos, things that I was doing pre, which actually, it's all turned out really perfectly, I think, because it adds a lot more rawness to it. You know, when something is too scripted or is contrived you know so this is very much parts of it is very much fly on the wall um and then we also we went back and did some reflections as well so we've we're actually current you know so we've got we've got our thoughts on it after three years um you know and 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 what we learned from it and and what we took away from it so there is, um, it's quite emotional. I'll be honest. It's emotional for all three of us. I love that you did that because when a film ends, you always want to know what happened now, you know, like, yeah, instead of just, so that's great. I'm glad that you went and filmed everybody years later on their experience, because I think you're going to have a lot more ideas about it. <laughs> Yeah. Because now you're not exhausted and, you know, you have some separation. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, when you're so far into something, you can't see the wood for the trees, you know, and you need that time and space away to to digest everything that went on and, and how how massive it was at the time, but also how very insignificant it is as well in the in the scheme of things, you know how tiny we all are, that experience I find hugely humbling um, yeah. when you see the footage and you see how little you are and you see that the world just keeps spinning, whether you're in it or not, you know, whether right. you've got anxiety or, you, you know, it does just keep spinning and we can get so lost in our little bubble of a, of a, a world and, you know, work and family and all of that can become very um suffocating so to remove yourself from that is is hugely humbling ah. and just a reminder to kind of in you know do your best to enjoy your life because right. it, it is hard isn't it living is hard <laughs> like it is every day is a challenge yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um what what did you edit the film on uh premiere premiere great premiere Pre well i didn't but um, <laughs> Matt, Matt and Eric did. But do you know the great thing as well, I have to say, is that my whole team now has really, has really grown. You know, I went from doing, from having never made a film, being in front of the camera rather, and now I, I have this wonderful um, team of people who do actually know and have done, you know. So, and, and also, again, all of those people we're through an evolution of, of meetings. You know, Matt, for example, made a fantastic film called Stronger Than Bullets before, and he had been on the festival route with that. And so I'm learning from him and from David and Lynn, who are my executive producers, and we have a sales, um, Adam, who's doing sales as well. So, you know, now I have this, um, this, massive pool of knowledge from all of these people that believe in the in the story and in the project and that's very special too the whole thing has just been kind of grossly very special <laughs> you know? well, yeah i'm glad that you had such a positive at the end experience that bonded you guys um because sometimes people walk away never to look back you know so i'm glad yeah. that through the trials and the tribulations of this grueling expedition, um, it bonded you even stronger. 
That's really sweet. Yeah, do you know why I think that is, Tammy? Because none of it was ever to do with money. It was to do with with the the love for it and the and the importance of what we're trying to the message that we're trying to deliver. I think especially now in this world, you know, it's so divisive everything and you know, oh gosh. And so to to have something like this come out, I think is really very refreshing. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah. I'm seeing more of that though, which is nice that I'm drawn to more of the um, heartfelt stories, like people coming yeah. together versus separating. So it's kind of nice. At least my world right now is feeling that way. So like you're kind of sharing, yeah. it's it's tough out there. But what you can cultivate, you know, it just starts with you in a way, you know, you and then yeah. from you. And it ripples out, doesn't it? Yes. It, yeah. You know, it becomes infectious. Yes. I love it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so any last uh, thoughts that you'd like to share? Oh, sure. Just thank you for having me on and, and taking the time. I mean, it's uh, it's always lovely to talk about it, you know, something when you're so passionate. And and I'm really excited for it to be, you know, viewed by people and get people's feedback. Um, I think I can say that on behalf of the whole team as well. Um, how can they see it at this point? We're not entirely sure at this moment. So it's, <laughs> we've entered it into film festivals and... <laughs> We're at the stage of, um, with, you know, waiting for decisions and working out how it's going to be distributed. So watch this space, I think, is the is the best thing to say. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to put your website. Will it be eventually on your website at least where to go see it at, so people could check back? Or Film Freeway? Um, film Freeway, I think, yeah, or my website or both. Okay. Yeah, because I have a blog on there about some of the background about it. Okay. Well, I'll include that. And um, just thank you so much, Janie, for being on the show. This was so great. I, I just really love to hear about this story. Thank you, Tammy. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to get out there and make a film. Reach out to your local filmmakers group to get involved and connect. Please subscribe to the show if you like it and follow me on Instagram at Tammy Madero. Until we meet again, what's your story?